Welcome to TVBS Meeting Room, where we tackle global issues with a view from Taiwan. I'm your host, Wen Chi Yu. APEC is one of the few international organizations of which Taipei, uh, Taiwan, is a member. This year, the United States is hosting APEC and on the margin, the much anticipated summit between Xi Jinping and Joe Biden will take place in San Francisco. We're so pleased to have U.S. Ambassador for APEC, Matt Murray, with us today to share and maybe break some news on APEC priorities. Welcome, Ambassador Murray. Well, thanks, Wen Chi. It's great to be here, and I'm excited to be uh, talking to you from San Francisco, where we're getting ready for uh, APEC Leaders Week next week. Well, I know how you and your team have been working so hard over the last few months, uh, almost a year now, to prepare for this moment. Um, the United States is the host for APEC, and what do you hope to accomplish by the end of this summer, uh, the summit, and what should we expect? Well, I think uh, when we go back to last year's APEC, Thailand did just such, such a remarkable job of hosting and it was during Leaders Week in Thailand that Secretary of State Tony Blinken said that we really wanted to use our U.S. APEC host year to meet the moment that we're in. And what he meant by that is that, you know, we are facing a number of challenges in the region, uh, economic headwinds, uh, you know, the lingering effects from the global pandemic and, you know, a number of different challenges, uh, including the climate crisis and, and other things that the whole region really needs to focus on. So we have uh, very much you know, wanted to use our APEC host year to be able to uh, work with the other economies uh, to come up with uh, some ideas and some solutions uh, to looking at areas like uh, sustain, you know, how to promote sustainable and inclusive growth, uh, how to have a healthier uh, digital economy, and also how to uh, really promote resilience and inclusion uh, around the region. And I think I've been really struck in the last year with how much all of the APEC economies have in common when mm. it comes to defining uh, what the challenges are. Um, but the, you know, we all need to work uh, together to figure out uh, what we do about those challenges and how we can do things collectively uh, where we can help each other. Uh, APEC, as you know, is an organization that features uh, 21 economies that make up uh, half of global trade and roughly 60% of global GDP. And as you said, Taiwan is an important uh, member of that uh, under the, the name of Chinese Taipei. Uh, and so, you know, we, we're really looking forward to next week's opportunity to showcase, um, you know, what we've been able to do this year on these different priorities. Well, over the years, uh, it's interesting that you were saying there are obviously challenges and the challenges that you put out, they're mostly regional challenges. Um, and, you know, some would say APEC as an economic forum is less important now because it was born during the time when the world was much more interested in economic cooperation, trade liberalization and globalization, right? All these things that you uh, just alluded to. Um, but however, you know, U.S. and China tensions and competition intensified over the last few years. And so economic interests are now very much intertwined with national security interests. Um, and so more got rails are being put in place. And so how have you been working with leaders uh, in other economies to convince them of the importance of APEC? Yeah, it's a great question and a great point. I think that um, all of the economies uh, in APEC have all evolved in different ways over the last uh, you know, 30 years. Um, one of the things I love about APEC is that it was founded in 1989. Uh, the first leaders level meeting was in 1993 here in the United States in Blake Island, Washington. And if you think about all of the, the things that we've tackled since then, you know, we had the Asian financial crisis, we had 9-11, we had the global financial crisis, now we've had COVID. Um, there certainly have been wars and other conflicts as well. But yet APEC uh, has evolved as an organization and, and has you know, continued to uh, find ways uh, to, be, uh, to be helpful and to contribute uh, to uh, addressing some of these global challenges. I think that um, you know, a lot of APEC's work during the COVID period was unfortunately out of sight, out of mind, because you know, it was all online and mm -hmm. you know, during Malaysia's host year and New Zealand's host year. But I think one of the things that happened during those two years that was really important is that 
APEC in a way um, you know, redefined itself a little bit and what its priorities are, essentially saying, okay, it's been, you know, uh, 20 years since the, you know, or more than 20 years since the Bogor goals in Indonesia, you know, what are the ways in which, you know, APEC adds value uh, in, the, in the current economy? And so, you know, that's where you had the Putrajaya Vision 2040 and the Aotearoa Plan of Action really define these uh, three drivers of economic growth, being trade and investment, uh, innovation and digitalization, and strong, sustained, uh, balanced, and inclusive growth. And, you know, I think when we look at those three areas, what has happened with APEC is it's become uh, much more comprehensive, you know, looking at, you know, how do you uh, work with economies uh, to really address uh, in a comprehensive way all the challenges um, that they may be facing. And I think coming out of the COVID pandemic, that's particularly important because we don't want uh, any communities to be uh, left behind. Uh, it also you know, shows that there's areas where we've done a lot of work in the past. For example, in 2011, when the United States last host, hosted, um, we launched uh, important work on women's economic empowerment and wanting that to be um, an issue that, that APEC economy is really focused on and we're very proud of our legacy there. But when you look at what happened during COVID and a lot of the challenges that women and all, you know, all of our economies faced during COVID, uh, you know, and, and the difficulty with um, women run small medium sized enterprises, being able to access supply chains, uh, the difficulties with the care economy, the difficulties with uh, women being able to fully participate, um, you know, in the economy uh, in, a, in a post COVID environment, I think shows that we still have a lot of work to do in those kinds of areas as well. So I would argue that it's even more important now than ever before because it's a much more, I think, uh, addressing a comp much more comprehensive set of issues. Well, one can argue that when, uh, you know, too many issues are trying to be included in this um, forum, that maybe uh, it'll become harder for anyone to have any focus, right? So. Um, I think we saw that the Biden administration also uh, announced the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework last year. Um, and then there are various you know, regional trade agreements from the earlier uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, to the newer version, which is the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP. Um, you know, it, it is a little bit confusing for some people if they're not paying a lot of attention like you do. So help us understand what are the differences and what does each one try to accomplish? And more importantly, you as sort of the point person coordinating from the U.S. government, State Department on all these uh, related regional economic frameworks and, you know, I would say uh, structures. Um, how do you how do you really handle so many complicated different uh, frameworks? Yeah, so I think you know this has been a, a well documented challenge that the region has faced over the years, um, the so called you know Asian Noodle Bowl of all the various different kinds of agreements. Asian Noodle Bowl, that's yeah. what it's called. Okay. So so you do have a lot of different uh, you know trade agreements, you know either regional agreements or bilateral agreements or preferential trade agreements. Um, or, you know, other kind of forum like, like APEC, where we're not finalizing trade agreements, but where we are doing a lot of things that support uh, regional trade. Um, I think that, uh, you know, over the years, uh, there's certainly been a focus on, uh, you know, opening up uh, you know, market access and lowering barriers to entry, also eliminating, you know, behind the border trade barriers. Uh, also setting standards on issues, important issues like labor, the environment, and state-owned enterprises. Um, and I think we've seen that evolve uh, in recent years to the point where, um, for example, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework has four pillars, one which focuses on trade, including digital trade, another mm -hmm. which focuses on supply chains, a third which focuses on decarbonization, and a fourth which focuses on um, anti-corruption and tax. And I think what um, that agreement, you know, or that framework definitely reflects is that if we've learned, you know, learned one thing over the last several years when it comes to international and regional trade agreements uh, and international economic arrangements, uh, you need to take a comprehensive approach. Um, you know, when we look yeah. at uh, what happened during COVID and the breakdown of supply chains, 
yeah. where we look at the challenges we're facing with the climate crisis and, and the, uh, some of the um, uh, maybe the disincentives to decarbonize that are out there, uh, we realize that we need to uh, really focus much more in these areas. I think APEC has been a great platform this year to continue to do that uh, through, uh, through this organization. But certainly, I think we're going to see more efforts out there to, uh, uh, to try to take that you know, more comprehensive approach and address the fundamentals of you know, all of the various uh, challenges that are out there when it comes to uh, you know, economic and trade cooperation. Well, you mentioned uh, quite a bit about COVID and its uh, disruptions. Um, and, you know, one of them obviously is the supply chain um, issue. And, you know, I think the supply of semiconductors uh, became a serious concern for a lot of uh, countries in the world, especially in the U.S., right? Taiwan this time, again, is represented by Morris Chang, uh, who's the founder of TSMC. And uh, the strategic importance of semiconductors just cannot be understated because it's Economic security is national security. Um, so will there be any discussion on semiconductor issues, uh, supply chain resilience at APEC? And how has APEC discussed issues such as, you know, even harder ones like export controls and barriers that US and China pretty much impose on each other? So our focus in APEC has been on, when it comes to supply chains, has been on supply chain resiliency. Um, you know, how can we uh, make sure that, um, you know, economies have the information that they need in, in order to uh, set up supply chains that will be resilient in the face of, of various challenges. Uh, within APEC, we have a supply chain resiliency action plan, uh, which uh, is now, I believe, in its third year uh, and certainly is a product of, of some of the things that we learned um, during the COVID pandemic. And you're absolutely right. I mean, semiconductors is one of those sectors where we've seen, uh, you know, some really uh, significant challenges in recent years when there's been shortages of certain kinds of semiconductors. Uh, we experienced that here in the United States in 2021 with the auto sector. Um, but I think what we what we're also learning is again, it's been talking about a comprehensive approach. You know, supply chains are a very multifaceted challenge as well. Um, you know, semiconductors do get a lot of attention, uh, and rightfully so. Um, but also, when President Biden uh, launched the uh, his executive order on you know supply chains, um, he also focused on um, you know EV batteries, focused mm -hmm. on pharmaceutical APIs, focused on um, uh, uh, also um, sorry critical minerals, mm -hmm. and so you know. It, it, there's a number of different sectors that we have to be concerned about, and that means there's a number of different approaches that we also uh, need to take. So, you know, certainly we, we do talk with our partners in Taiwan and other APEC economies about some of the challenges that they're having. In Taiwan's case, uh, they're one of the you know, largest semiconductor producers in the world, um, but may not have, uh, you know, as much production of some of the other key sectors. And so we really need to keep those communication lines open on how we can uh, you know, work together to address that, that very significant challenge. And, and have you been able to use APEC to discuss export controls uh, issues? And you just mentioned mineral, uh, you know, exports as well. I mean, which now, you know, China has just imposed um, some ban. So how, how are those issues or how are these issues being discussed at APEC, if at all? So within APEC, uh, you know, export controls are not normally on the agenda because they, they normally are discussed in other settings, uh, you know, around that sort of national security side. Uh, mm -hmm. But certainly there are a lot of sideline conversations at APEC meetings uh, about, you know, current challenges and, and certainly, you know, how some of these uh, issues are being addressed uh, can be discussed uh, on the sidelines anytime these economies get together. So it sounds like APEC continues to be, a, to be a, a forum where I think, you know, the region feels that um, it, it wants to work together, right? So um, it, it's also, you know, big news that finally um, that, you know, Xi Jinping is attending the leader summit and it sounds like Biden and Xi summit is indeed taking place. Um, if you could, what can we expect uh, out, you know, out of the Xi Jinping and Biden summit? 
Well, I think as you've seen from you know high level officials in, on the U.S. side throughout the year, you know we stress that we want to keep the lines of communication uh, with the People's Republic of China open, and so you know I've had a number of different high level visits uh, to Beijing in the last year. Secretary Blinken, Secretary Raimondo, Secretary Yellen, uh, Special Envoy Kerry, uh, and then uh, certainly you know welcoming uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi to Washington the week before last. And so keeping the, the lines of communication open is very important and um, you know also uh, focusing on managing competition responsibly and you know working you know working and focusing on that uh, as we go forward. So certainly working towards a, a, a meeting uh, between President Biden and, and President Xi uh, next week. Um, and you know from my perspective as you know, US ambassador for APEC, you know, I think this is, again, one of the really exciting things about mm -hmm. Apex uh, Value Add is that it is a place uh, which is convening leaders on you know, an annual basis where we can really have uh, very high level conversations, both multilaterally and bilaterally. And obviously, the, the discussion with uh, you know, President Xi is um, you know, probably the, uh, the most um, high profile uh, yes. opportunity. Uh, but, you know, there's also opportunities. We're going to be welcoming uh, President Jokowi to uh, Washington just before San Francisco. Uh, we just had Prime Minister Albanese in Washington a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, so there's a lot of activity and we have uh, the secretary in uh, Japan and Korea, uh, you know, in the next few days. So um, there's a lot of opportunities for, for high level engagement with all of our, our partners around the region. So uh, what are your biggest worries for the upcoming APEC week and uh, what are you most looking forward to? So I think we're in a um, you know pretty good place in what we've been building towards and building towards next week. We've we've worked very hard as you said at the top you know across the whole year uh, with the other partner uh, you know economies but also with our private sector and other stakeholders. Um, you know it's been really great to see uh, you know our our private sector rise to the challenge and, and mm -hmm. also hosting the APEC CEO Summit and the APEC Business Advisory Council dialogue with leaders and a lot of different, uh, you know, events uh, to really showcase uh, the importance of public-private collaboration in APEC as well. Um, but we're talking about a massive event, largest international event that San Francisco has hosted since 1945. Um, wow. We have 21 economies plus a couple of guest economies plus, you know, 1,200 uh or so high-level business executives. Right. Um, so I think what I'm, you know, uh, looking forward to are those sort of nice surprises that happen uh, that maybe we didn't plan for. You know, uh, an issue that gets resolved, uh, an economic policy issue that gets resolved, or a relationship um, that improves. You know, things that, that we didn't necessarily uh, uh, think would be benefits of this, you know, this undertaking, and that to me is really exciting. I think the the thing that keeps me awake at night is it, it is it's just a huge undertaking. There's lots yeah. of moving pieces. Um, there's uh, you know a lot of different um, uh, you know people in, in our government and yes. our stakeholder community. Uh, not to mention in, in all of the other economies who have you know definite views about what a successful APEC Leaders Week looks like, and we want to try to deliver for everybody. Um, but that's uh, that's going to be a challenge anytime we talk about, uh, you know, hosting an event of this magnitude. And, you know, one of the really the things I've always enjoyed this year is the par opportunity to partner with uh, city government, local government, mm -hmm. in, uh, in hosting these kinds of meetings. We've done this in now Honolulu and, and you know, Palm Springs and Detroit and Seattle. Right. But each of those meetings was much smaller scale. And so this is uh, this is the big one with all the leaders in town. So, um, you know, I'm excited about working with uh, the city of San Francisco, uh, but it is, you know, it's a massive challenge uh, for them as well to be able to to put everything on and, and pull it off without a hit. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much. I think uh, almost all your work and efforts, uh, you're going to be very proud of, I'm sure. So huge congratulations. Um, and of course, I, I want to give you another congratulations uh, when everything concludes successfully. Um, but most importantly, uh, wishing you all the best of luck for everything to go smoothly at APEC. And um, I hope, you know, at the end of APEC, you and your team will get some, you know, well-deserved um, 
relax and family time as well. But uh, we all look Great. forward to hearing a lot of good news coming out of uh, APEC.